we're back for part two of our conversation with Fred Wilson. So as you look to make investments on that kind of a time horizon, first of all, what's interesting is that a lot of them are starting, you know, the, 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 the economics of, of many of these projects are such that there's a lot of money to be made in the short term, some of which might be considered, uh, you know, contrary to, to the overall goals that we've been talking about. Um, but as you look to invest in, in, in these kinds of new businesses and new architectures, what do you find particularly compelling right now? What's interesting at the moment uh, and, and, and you know, worth paying attention to, particularly if you're, you know, as we are talking to a lay audience who may just be getting into this? What I'm always looking for are things that you can do with a new architecture that you could not do with an old architecture. Um, and so if you go back to the early days of the internet, the first things we did were, were we took things that we already knew, like a newspaper or you know, a, a stock market or what we call it a brokerage firm actually, and we put them on the internet. So we got things like E-Trade and NewYorkTimes.com. Um, but it wasn't really until um, what you coined uh, Web2. Didn't you come up with that name, John? I, I think it was Tim O'Reilly uh, with me. I, I, I guess I'm the popularizer. <laughs> so it wasn't until we really got Web2 that we got the read write web. And, um, and all of a sudden, uh, we started to realize like, oh, no, that's putting things up on the Internet's not the really the thing because you really aren't creating anything new you're just delivering an older thing in a better package but but all of a sudden with web 2 we got things that you could never really do before things like facebook and things like um, youtube and, and those sorts of things which were really about um, letting everybody be a content creator and letting everybody um, be a seller on etsy or, or whatever it might be and it, it, it was all of a sudden the the user was the producer of the thing as opposed to the consumer of the thing and that was and that had never been possible before in an analog world um, and so that's what the internet really made available to people that 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 the traditional um, uh, software systems couldn't do and so the thing that I look for in web 3 are things that that we haven't figured out how to do. And so when I saw NFTs, for example, back in 2016, before they even coined the term NFT, I, I was fascinated by the idea that you could create something that was unique, truly unique, a digital asset that was unique. So, you know, we all lived through the MP3 era and we saw how something that used to be scarce, like music, all of a sudden, you know, became completely commoditized by virtue of the fact right. that it, it no longer was scarce. And so we, we went through this period of like 20 years where we're like, oh, all media is now screwed because there's no way to, to make media scarce. And we tried things like DRM and there was all these sort of like clunky technologies that we tried to put the genie back in the bottle um, with digital media and it just didn't work. And so we had these business models that like Spotify and things like that, that sort of acknowledged that anybody had access to music and and then I saw NFTs and I said, oh, my gosh, here's how you make a digital asset scarce um, right. and using cryptography and blockchains and 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 all of that. Um, and so I got very excited about the fact that here was a here was something that um, you could use a blockchain to do that you really we had not been able to figure out how to do before. That's le led to my investment in Dapper and, and a few other things as well. Um, and so I want to see more of those sorts of things emerge. Um, and, right. you know, I can't point to uh, a lot of good examples of that, which is unfortunate because that means we're still super, super early in, in this journey. Um, but that's what I want to see is, is, is founders, entrepreneurs, technologists coming up with ways to use this set of technologies that we call Web3 now. Um, to deliver new experiences that have never been able to be delivered to customers before. Uh, last question for you, Fred. Um, you know, again, given that our audience are, you know, a lot of folks at, at P&G, a lot of their partners, um, vendors, and, and in sort of the ecosystem of a, of, of a large influential company like P&G, 
what advice do you give, would you give them in terms of how they think about both this space, crypto and Web3, and, and, and a bit more broadly, how do they, how can they think about innovation generally and, and embracing it in a way that makes sense, you know, for a more traditional business? Well, I think it's, it's always hard for a company. Uh, I'm on the boards of some companies that now are quite large, obviously not anywhere near as large as P&G, but, um, you know, that have billions of dollars of revenue. And they often look at, at these things and they're like, those things are too small, right? They're not going to move the needle for me. Uh, I can't buy this company because it's too small. I can't start this project because it's too small. If it, if it can't deliver a billion dollars of revenue in three years, you know, we, we, can't, we can't justify that investment. And it's totally rational right. behavior. And, and as a board member of companies like that, I'm, I'm one of the people saying that, right? And yet I'm in the business of backing, you know, two or three founders who are starting a company that's not going to have revenue for two years. So I, I see both sides of it. I think that the, the things I think that big companies can do and should do, um, these are not new ideas, um, but I, I'm a big fan of them. I think that they should um, have, a, have a venture arm that invests in um, leading edge companies, uh, not because it's going to necessarily deliver enough financial return to move the needle for their shareholders, but just so that they have a group of people inside their organization who are doing what I do every day, which is meeting with uh, founders and seeing new ideas. And then I think it may also make sense to have um, parts of the organization that are designed to do smaller scale things, you know, R&D efforts or innovation uh, divisions or whatever, where, where the objectives are different. They're not, they're not about, um, you know, scaled businesses and things like that, but they're, they're just, you know, they're just about, you know, being, you know, uh, a participant in the innovation economy. And that's, so it's, I just think that, you know, th those are, by the way, like I said, those are not new ideas, but I think that big, all big companies today seem to be doing some flavor of that. Um, and I think that that's what they need to be doing uh, because sometimes some things come along and very quickly impact their business. I look at, for example, you know, one of the things, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick here, John, one of the things that mobile phones allowed us to do were build applications that knew where you were. Never before did we have the ability to have software that knew where you were. And of course, entrepreneurs quickly built things like Uber and Lyft. And those businesses have really transformed transportation. I mean, really, right. truly have trans transportation. So if you were in the, you know, um, travel business, uh, if you were in the rent-a-car business, if you were in the, you know, auto OEM business, you know, all of a sudden you look at that and within the span of two or three years, you were st starting to feel it in your core business, right? So there can sometimes innovation can come along that can actually impact you quite quickly. So I think that's why you've got to be set up to react to those things. Um, and being, being blind to them or unable to react to them, you know, is obviously a very dangerous place to be. Exactly, well put. Well, Fred Wilson, thank you so much for joining us for this fascinating signal conversation. I wish we could go on for, for hours, and I know we could, um, but we have to stop now. So again, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it was my pleasure. A lot of fun.